Okay. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. You proud of me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. I don't know why there's a mental block to that. I really don't. I, it's something about the W word. You know, it's something about it's something about the W word. I don't know. Okay. So here's the deal. We have been talking a lot about first going through suttas to show you what the Buddha was saying and his basic message about hindrances and distractions. So he was pursuing in his suttas a pretty clear message. When, when we talk about sometimes uh, wanting to take uh, one sutta out of the Majjhima Nikaya, some people want to remove one, one, one. And I don't want them to remove one, 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 because that's a real sutta. And you know, the first time I read about somebody wanting to take that one out, I thought to myself, wait a second, wait a second. Where are they practicing? What are they practicing? Okay, okay. They're practicing this way very hard. They're concentrating very hard. They're doing absorption meditation. So for them, when you go into 111, there is no way that they would believe that you could detect, for instance, uh, that you could detect tension and tightness changing in your body. There was, they wouldn't believe it because they wouldn't believe what you're saying about craving. They would argue with that sometimes, and they wouldn't believe that you would be able to detect this arising tension and tightness. But we have figured out what this TWIM is, this Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, is the correct definition for right effort in the Eightfold Path. Now, the, 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 direct, the, the definition they use is for outside of the Eightfold Path and everything else. But it's also in Buddhism, of course, because we, I may have said that to you because everybody has to work very hard, persevere, stick with it, don't give up with anything that you do if you wanna become an expert at it. Isn't that true? You have to keep doing it and work very hard. People who are musicians know this. I knew it when I was a musician and May knows that she teaches piano, but I, I found out that was true with cycling and people said, you can't do this, you're a woman. I said, well, that's not gonna hold up. <laughs> this is a bicycle. I can ride my bike 200 miles, 300 miles. Of course I can, <laughs> but I got two different coaches and they pushed me and worked really hard and I did, I did. And then retrain the mind. It's breaking. Well, yeah. what would you like me to do? Uh, Is it okay now? It again, back. Uh, it's blinking. It's blinking at me, but. I should wink back, I guess. Okay. Anyway, um, so we've been investigating about the hindrances, and we've been looking at what the Buddha said to do with them. And because of this working so hard thing around the right effort in the Eightfold Path, and that one went into your practice of meditation. So people were trying really hard to fight the hindrance, to push the hindrance down. So we have all these words in modern writing books. Uh, I actually, I can't find my list, but there's like 11 of them. So let's see, destroy it, annihilate. When the, when the hindrance comes, hi, I'm a little hindrance. I wanna bother you. Now really all the hindrance wants is tea and cookies and he'll sit there and eat the tea, drink the tea and eat the cookies and he won't bother you. 
he only wants to stay for a few minutes. He really wants to talk with you and hold your attention. But if he can't do that, usually he'll stay there and drink the tea and eat the cookies and leave. <laughs> okay, so just leave him there. Don't fight with him because after all, a Nietzsche cousin, a Nietzsche told us that whatever arises passes away, even the hindrance when he comes to visit or the she comes to visit is going to pass away. So why fight with something that's not going to last anyway, right? So we developed these words in modern time. Let's destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, subdue it, suppress it, stop it, control it make it not come back anymore. But what did we learn about the meditation? If you're pretty advanced now, you have figured out by now that the best way to advance down the path is to be quiet and still and not worry about where you are. Simply sit down and watch just to see what happens next. So in the text, we had a whole different set of words. Let's relinquish it, release it, allow it, let it go, let it be, which was in keeping with cousin Anicca. <laughs> it wasn't ignoring what Anicca said to us. Anicca said, all oh, things, they're all everything in the world and the planets in the universe, everything is impermanent. Everything that arises will pass away. And we just don't want to believe that. We still want to struggle to stop this visitor from coming. So when I was looking at TWIM today, I was stumbling through a number of things for this talk, researching some stuff. And um, I thought if I had to tell you what exactly precisely is TWIM, successful? Why is it successful? What did Bunty find out when he was in the cave and he took the Majima Nikaya and he went through the whole thing and he went through it again and started to go through it again when they came to get him and say, come back to Malaysia. You know, he was trying to go through it the third time, he told me. But he's testing every one of the suttas that has anything to do with helping you with your meditation. But what did he find when he was in the cave? What did he figure out? Number one, he found out, uh, he figured out about the, uh, the right effort isn't what it was, it was saying it was. The right effort was actually these four steps of recognizing when the mind is getting tight, releasing it and relaxing it, which was a purifying mechanism. And then bring up, a wholesome instead of this stuff, bring up a wholesome and keep that going, which was the smile, the relax, the smile and return, you see. Also, he is a master teacher concerning the Anapanas. On the in breath, on the out breath is one dyad, okay? On the in, on the in breath, on the out breath, another dyad. There's 16 of them. If you go into, into find them, you'll find the instructions that have 16 points. But when we started questioning people across the country, when we were driving back and forth across the United States, how meant what are we would listen to talks and listen to things that were happening, and there were only 12 or 14 dyads being taught. So, which were the dyads that were being left out to tranquilize the bodily formation the correct way? That one was said, but it was a mistake. The brackets of breath, the bodily formation of breath was incorrect and we finally went to New York and we talked with Bhikkhu Bodhi. Bonte talked with him. I was a mouse or a fly on the wall. I just got to stay there and watch the conversation. And Bhikkhu Bodhi promised he would go away and he would examine this more closely and figure out if the translation, the way 
that Nanamoli had pointed to if it was correct or not. So he comes back to us and let he sent us a letter and told us what he was doing. He, he's going to change it in the next edition. So it was changed in the fourth edition. Now, it was changed by order of the author of the book to change it from bodily formation of breath to bodily formation. And remember, we all, he also gradually came to realize that most Westerners especially believe that the body is from here down, from here down. And this happens because if you're a doctor, major probably has run into this, people don't wanna talk about their family having anything wrong from here up, okay? That your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your teeth, your ears, it's okay, but nothing inside this, certainly, we can't talk about that. So a, a disease or a, dis, a disorder in the mind is something you wanna hide from everybody, like people wanted to hide cancer for so long and didn't want to say anything if the symptoms were there. So realizing this, we realized that the head, when we start talking about the head for a couple of years, we were talking about it all the time, you know, the head is actually hooked to the body. It's part of the body, okay? So we went into the text and Buddha says, from the top of your head to your toes, that is the bodily formation. So then we know that Dhammapada told us that what did it say in the first verse? Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. And also the mind-body connection, the Nama Rupa discovery that if you calm the mind, the body will follow. This is all part of this, all part of this. Now, when we look at, at Sariputta, Venerable Sariputta tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to look right inside his mind piece by piece step by step and see something remarkable because we're going to discover his mind state when he decided that he was going to do his practice seriously till he finished. That's what we're looking at. I mean, the Buddha was really excited. You can tell that in the first page, right? For one thing, I think, can anybody remember what the Buddha thought about Sariputta. He is what? He is what? I said this to one of my students and she screamed at him, he's wise, he's wise. Yes, that's right, he's wise. But what does it mean? Remember that we told you a secret, not really a secret, but people kind of forgot that the word wisdom reflects in a capsule. Wisdom is all of the, all of the parts or pieces you need to understand in order to understand how the mind works, okay? So when you look at this, I mean, the Buddha is telling these monks, pay attention, because I'm going to talk about Sariputta's practice tonight. And he starts out, Sariputta is wise. Sariputta has great wisdom. Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrative wisdom. Okay, that's pretty cool. What does it mean? Well, once we figured out that wisdom meant dependent origination, it was like a pointing finger. If you say any phrase in the text, if you think about it meaning something pointing in the direction of dependent origination. Now watch this, Sariputta is wise. He knows how to watch dependent origination. Sariputta has great wisdom. He's done this very well and very broadly. He has done it. Sariputta has wide wisdom. To me, that means he's watching it outside around you instead of just watching how it works here. With, that's interesting. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. He's happy because he knows how everything works. Most of us who have practiced for the first time in a retreat and really gotten free of the, the weight coming off our shoulder, remember how joyous you were. And it was more than uplifted joy, more than mudita because of the relief 
And the relief came, why? Because someone finally told me at 50 years old how my mind and my brain works in relationship to my behavior and problems that I had when I was a teenager. He has quick wisdom. He can watch dependent origination. The moment two men start fighting, the moment he sees people in an argument, the moment he sees two crowds together, he can see the dependent originated immediately and immediately inside his practice. Quickly, he can see it. He has keen wisdom. That's the one inside the practice. Keen wisdom means sharp observation. He watches something very keenly to see precisely what's wrong. I used to work for a veterinarian for a summer and he'd stand there by the fence and say, what are you doing? He's watching the horse to figure out really carefully by watching how he runs, walks, where the bone is injured. That's what he was doing. Keen wisdom. This is keen. And Sarah has penetrated the birth of the consciousness to I'm sorry, Puta gain insight into states one by one as they occurred. That's pretty cool. That's a keen kind of observation. Now, do you remember? 95, in 95, when we go back and look at 95, um, there's these steps that the Buddha was teaching you in regards to a student coming to a master teacher and how they could be the most successful. And there were 12 of those, 12 pieces. And one of them, there was faith, visiting, paying respect, giving ear, hearing the Dhamma, memorizing the teachings. This is really fun because some people want to memorize the teachings now. So I'm pulling out all of the out loud suttas that we've memorized before again. Examination of the meaning as you're memorizing it. That's what's so cool about memorizing stuff. Reflective acceptance of the teachings because as you're walking along, you realize that it's really true. That's what you see, that's what you know enthusiasm application here it is scrutiny tonight we're going to scrutinize sariputta that's what we're going to do so here we go we're going to go in here to the document if you have the document you can follow it as we go step by step that's where we're going to go first oh well i know you can come up let's see there we go so I'm going to skip, I'm going to go past the sutta because if I had to do the sutta too tonight, it takes much, much too longer because this is a study page that was done on this a long time ago. And this is the way we started to tear things apart. So that's what I want you to see what we did. Question and answer review for 111. So we're going to look at the way section four is formatted for you to scrutinize what is going on in Venerable Sariputta's mind operation during his, his meditation. And in section four, when we go to um, section four, if we were to go back and look at it from the, you know, way back here in the beginning, this is where these terms come from in the sutta directly. And here, I, the way I formatted this was so that you'd be able to see them when you sit and read it through. But going back, let's go to the scrutiny now. We have to take apart everything. The thinking and examining, the, the thinking, the, the examining, the joy, the happiness, the unification or collectedness of mind. The thinking is thoughts that were just arising, thoughts were still coming up when he was in this level. The, the, and, and these thoughts just are happening from the operation of the brain. So nobody, this is where I came to conclusion, no, I couldn't find anything in the text that told me right out straight, we're supposed to stop our brain from thinking. It's not gonna happen, you're not gonna do it. The next one is the examining. It's an analytical types of thoughts that come up are able to arise in the first jhana. This can happen in the first jhana. So thoughts are just popping up. And also analytical types of thoughts 
can function and happen without you asking them to in the first jhana. The joy, the arrival of the uplifted joy is really wonderful. It's just wonderful because you're so light and you feel so happy and you, uh, you can't tell me why, <laughs> you can't tell me why you're happy. And then the happiness, when joy fades away, there is a tranquility arises. And when tranquility fades away, happiness or sukha is left. So sukha is happiness. Buddhist happiness is not a, uh, in this, when you're practicing, Buddhist happiness is a quiet inner contentment. And the contentment is happening from understanding a discovery that you made. Now here you see the unification of mind. This is another way of saying gentle collectedness of mind. Now this is where we have to be careful. If I had the Vasudhi Manga, I could show you something I found that was very funny because uh, in the first page on meditation, if you go into the Vasudhi Manga, it talks about pro it, what you should be doing is developing a productive level of concentration. To me, that means a, a level of concentration where I can be still, let everything go and watch what's happening just to see what's happening next. So I can let go of things and it's a unification, a unified purpose is here. And this is my window and I'm looking through the window and watching, but I, it's, it's not a forced thing, not like this. We have information about how everything works. We can stay there, but other people have trouble staying there, you know, because they're so concerned with this and this and the level of, of, perfection of being erect and straight and just right that they could say they cannot go there. Now, eventually people who are practicing like that certainly can learn very quickly to come here with a different coach. And all of a sudden you get the, you sort of get the icing on the cake. You've got discipline, you know how to follow directions. You have been uh, sitting for longer periods of time, but you never had permission before to let go and just watch. And I love to see the people move over and see that as if they had their basic uh, pedagogy training with handle and the, the skills on the piano, but now we're gonna let you play a concert piece. Now we're gonna let you really see what the piano can do. In this case, now we're gonna let you into the mind. We're gonna let you see how everything works. In this particular time in the first jhana, he still has contact feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness. Now, what Bonte pointed out when he was teaching this, this confirms that the five aggregates, the khandas, are fully operational during the time that he is in the jhana. Think about that, because many, many, many places, people will say, well, that's not, not right. You can't have that happen in contact and this, to be in, once you're in the jhana, there is this myth that everything else is finished. But we go back to 107 and say, wait a minute, there's eight stations on this, uh, on this path. You could say it's a train and there's eight stations you go past to get to the ninth destination, cessation. Okay, but um, when we read 107, 107 in section three, it distinctly tells us when the Buddha is talking to the accountant, Moggallana, it distinctly told him they were having this discussion about how do you teach accountants? And the accountant then turns around and asks the, uh, the, the Buddha, Isn't, is that how you are teaching? Um, are you teaching people how to do the practice that you teach, you see? And um, they compare their training. In this particular sutta, it's kind of fun because the Buddha opts, he opts for his simile on how I teach you. And I, I still watch people and I always, this is a perfect simile. 
how do you teach a young colt to become a master horse, master trained horse for a king? How do you do that step by step? And so we end up getting involved with the horse trainer that is in number 65, section 33. And when we see, it doesn't just happen that the, the, uh, the mindset and, and the level of concentration or the level of, and the level of equanimity are perfected at the first jhana. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't. And he's telling you this in 65 at section 33, when he starts to Badali is a clever horse trainer, obtains a fine bit and put, takes the colt is being made to get used to wearing the bit. And when I give you instructions for meditation, I ask you to sit down and do twim. You watch the beginners sometime. Now listen to the, to the cult. He displays some contortion, writhing and vacillation, but uh, through constant repetition and gradual practice, he becomes peaceful in this action with the bit, allowing it to stay in his mouth because he gets used to it. So you get used to sitting like we tell you to sit, uh, not too tight and not too loose. You get accustomed to this and your mind is very, very adaptable. It's not going to fight you. It's not going to fight you. It's going to adapt, but you need to understand how you can train uh, the mind and then you can train it very well. The next he's wearing the harness. And when the cult is being made to get used to wearing the harness, once again, he is doing something he never done before. That's the way he, he it talks about this. And he takes him to wearing the harness. And then he goes through the same sort of movement and shifting around his, his position in sitting and that sort of thing, the meditator, just like the horse. And then he has to keep in step, run in circles, prance, gallop, charge, and all these things have to happen, but every time he's trying to do something new, it's not gonna be the same as a moment before. And that's disturbing to the cult. And he has to get used to doing the new thing. Well, here, what's happening is body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness are the, uh, the kindness. And what else? matches that what else is the same thing the four foundations of mindfulness are the same thing the body feeling mind and dhammas you see we can take that on a chart and look at the five aggregates and the four foundations we see the same thing and a very old monk had a discussion once and said that's right they're the same thing you have it's all about getting to know the nature of them and realizing the impersonal nature of each one so you have the body, you have the feeling, still able to identify the feeling, perceiving what's happening inside. That's your perception, naming what you're seeing. You have thoughts still arising, the formations, and you are conscious. The consciousness, perception, and feeling are conjoined. That's what it tells you later on. You'll, you'll hear this if you're going to do the retreat with us, but you'll always hear this in 43, I think, or 44, one or the other, that feeling, perception, and consciousness are conjoined. They can't, one cannot operate without the other two. They, they are like, you know, a, uh, what do you say, like a um, molecule, three circles like a molecule. That's how they are, okay? So then he understood when he was watching, he understood in that place, in that first jhana, so indeed, these states not having been come into being, having been, they vanish. What does it mean? Here he confirmed that whatever arises always passes away. And this confirms anicca, impermanence of everything. So you have a verification in your...
Did we just lose her? Wait. But they, did we just lose her? I'm calling her one second. You're back. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back in again. Okay, now what's happening here is this passage that says, confirms whatever arises, passes away. Okay, these states not having been, they come into being and having been, they vanish. That's what you need to remember. remember. One time I was waiting for a bus after I learned this. <laughs> <laughs> the bus came and it missed me it went by <laughs> so I waited again and I almost got on the wrong bus but then I let that bus go and then I waited again and I, I just kept standing there saying well not <laughs> not having been the bus came and having been it vanished <laughs> I was doing this on the corner with the buses oh here comes another one and not having been another bus came and came into being and having been oops I had to make it vanish it was the wrong bus you see so we're learning these phrases now are we memorizing dhamma oh we're memorizing dhamma when you memorize the pieces of the training are you memorizing dhamma oh you are memorizing dhamma when you can do them in pali or do them in your own language are you memorizing dhamma as long as you're memorizing the pieces that uh you need to understand in regards to your practice, they're gonna go in deeper and deeper and deeper and hook into you. When I wanted to initially memorize suttas, you know, I had all kinds of ideas and found lots of short ones in different places and Bhante chastised me and said, no, that will not happen because I want you to do suttas that have the meat, the part, the best part of what it is you have to know to improve your practice. And so we came up with a list to use 
that all of them have pieces that are important in regards to our own practice. That's what he made on the list. And it's, he's, he's very wise because it isn't time for us to go into the Samyutta Nikaya and fool around with little short things. We have longer ones, but they're not hard because you need that material. You need to know it by heart. And that's why they're so important. But some of them are very easy to memorize. And you're going to laugh at me now because 148 is one of the easiest suttas to ever memorize. Why? Because it only has six sections to it to memorize. You have to do each one six times. One for the ear, one, one for the eye, the ear, the nose, the mouth, the body, and the mind. And as you do that, you're, you're memorizing it even stronger and stronger each time. And when you sit down and let it move around inside your head, it starts to locate other things you stored up there. And that's all part of your training. It's remarkable. Next one is regarding those states that, uh, that were not there and arose and were there and passed away. He abided with them. He watched them and, and when they were there, he abided how? He abided in his mind, unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free and dissociated. Seven pieces. Why are they, or six of them, why are those so important? This confirmed that Sariputta's frame of mind while in his meditation, it demonstrated that he observed through an impersonal perspective, an impersonal lens without personal opinions, free from personal opinions when he investigated and watched everything. He, this reflects his understanding of anatta, impersonal perspective, impersonal view. So when he watches, he watches it to see essentially what's happening and nothing else, not comparing it to anything else, only just watching it. That's what I want you to understand. He abided unattracted. He did not like or crave anything. He was unrepelled. He did not have any aversion towards anything. He was independent and detached and free and dissociated. He did not take anything personally. That's what those all mean. The same thing, they're a bunch of words mean the same thing. His detachment, he was not attached just the way he was not repelled. So he didn't like it, he didn't dislike it, he just watched it. Very clear on the laws of how he should be watching and he followed it. Next one, with a mind rid of barriers. This is implying that while in a jhana, no hindrances arise. Bhante agrees with this. So this confirms that Sariputta understood completely how to manage his hindrances. And he can note here that, uh, we can note here that he didn't feed them his attention at all. He was too interested in watching, too interested in understanding the whole path as he was going down it. He had no time to go in a dictionary or an encyclopedia in his head and figure out what was happening now, what was it like before, da 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 da, da. He could no, none of that. He just watched and let it go, let it go, let it go. Now, one person said to me when I taught this once, he said, but I'm in the, in the jhanas and I have hindrances. Actually, the moment you pay attention to a hindrance, you pop out of this jhana, you see? And until you settle the hindrance, then you can come back in the jhana. So this is what's different because in absorption jhana, you're sitting there and you can't move and neither can your head and it has pressure holding it there too until it's trained not to move. Absolutely. You see, it's more like a bark collar on the dog, you know. <laughs> if you move, arc, it's going to squeak, you know, shock you. You cannot. You have to stay right there very firmly. You see, no, 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 no. That's too tight. You see, relax, 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 relax. Next one, he understood there is no, there is an escape from beyond, beyond this. 
And with the cultivation of that attainment, um, well, the first part of this, this part means he clearly sensed here uh, that there is more to do beyond this point. This is a gut feeling. And if you look at yourself, you can identify with this you feel like there's more, you know it's not the end. And when you get interested in this, you go deeper and you go into the second and the third and the fourth. And then you, you've you changed into Karuna or you've changed into infinite space in Karuna, right? And then you've moved on to Mudita, you see? So he senses that there's more and beyond this. And a funny thing happens when you go into cessation and you come out, you know there's nothing more. You know there's nothing more. Uh, not beyond that, but you can do it again. And now that the, it's sort of like um, someone, me coming to you and you've never had snow around and I'm gonna teach you how to ice skate. And you do not believe you are gonna skate on that pond until the ice is ready. And then I'm gonna take you out. Once I convince you to get out on the ice and I get you balanced and you can go forward and backward and turn in a circle and stop and start, well, I don't see you for the rest of the day. <laughs> you're out there on, and you're, you're skating and having a really good, good time. And hopefully if it's the first time you've got a pillow in the pants and you're gonna fall down and you won't hurt yourself. <laughs> anyway, he understood there's an escape beyond this. And with the cultivation of that attainment, number seven, he confirmed that there is. Why, how did he do that? In his gut, his intuition told him in his mind, in his sense of everything, that there was more to see. And so he continued on with his observation. That's his mindfulness to go deeper and get more answers. He wants to see how deep he can go and which states any of this changes. So number eight, enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These are the qualities he had operating. He had enthusiasm, wide-eyed wonderment, what's coming next? He, he had decision to move away from what he's watching or stay there. His energy enough to keep sitting and not break his sitting. Mindfulness, his observation power was operating well. And his equanimity, his balance was very good. And the balance encompasses everything we just said because he realizes he knows the laws involved in all of this concerning the hindrances, concerning anicca, dukkha, and anatta, concerning this and his attention level. He's fascinated. He is fascinated with what he's doing, what he's seeing. This becomes a very interesting practice that was going on here. And uh, once we experience this, we realize that this is not the same as practicing a one-pointed concentration, which moves deeper into a state of absorption. With absorption, so what, what were uh, the qualities Venerable Sariputta developed during this, his investigation by using this more aware approach, okay? Now, before we say that, if he was going into absorption, he would not be able to have active, the aggregates active and have these things operating because absorption is a, um, it is a um, trance state and that they use it in, in the way they use it basically is using it to then come out and do the action of discovering the Vipassana pieces, you see. But what's happening here is different. We have to consider that he was fully capable of performing volition, choosing within this practice, the degree he needed of enthusiasm. He made decisions as needed in each level in order to minutely adjust his energy, increase or lower his mindfulness, observation power, watch, is equanimity, balance of mind, and stay aware of the level of attention that he had in his observation. That's all having to do with volition. That's decisions his mind is making, you see. So it's very different. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him, these states arose. 
known they were present, known they disappeared. This is confirming for us that full awareness was possible in each state arose and came up, become the present time. It becomes the present time and always disappears, making it possible to observe a Nietzsche every single level he passed through. So he understands very well what the signals are for the, uh, for the, the dukkha. So he understands the Anicca is, pro he's accepted totally that Anicca is part of nature and whatever arises is there and it goes away. I mean, if you don't understand Anicca, if you're restless uh, in relationship to Anicca, you need to take a walk in the country, in the forest, someplace, in a park, I don't care, but get in touch with trees, bushes, animals, ponds that are clean maybe, and uh, fish, frogs, everything and start noticing the function of a Nietzsche in everything around you, everything. The point here is, this is a confirmation that each observed condition noted above can be watched as the state arises, as they are present, as they pass away. So you're very, very, very calm, very, very still. But everything is an internal level of balance. There's nothing out here vibrating anymore. Very, very still. Very clear case of practicing in a similar way that we do when we practice tranquil wisdom insight meditation. Twim and uh, and we continuously, we can we continuously uh, keep repeating the six R's if anything disturbs us. He he, uh, the, the meditator, that's a T, let's put that one in too. I didn't see these before, whoops. The meditator experiences these qualities, states of mind one at a time, and he can become sharp enough to be fully aware of them during his meditation at the beginning, the middle and the end of each observation. Whoa, there we are, beginning, middle and end. He uses that a lot in his teaching, doesn't he? It's good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. I, observation is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. If we have balanced all these things properly, then we know that the balancing of them are allowing us to see internally and watch everything the Buddha was talking about. Is in, is there a name in Pali for this group of qualities developed as above? I I'm, I'm, don't know if Newton's out there or one of the Pali students, but you can take a crack at this. What, yes, there is, this is what I found. This is most likely referring to Iripada, which is inclusive of Chanda, meaning skillful desire. Now Chanda is what um, you know, Yoshin and I were talking about. Chanda is a swing word. See, Chanda is desire that's flexible. It's like wholesome desire in one situation. It can be used to mean unwholesome desire in another situation. It's a strange word. But we learned Chanda as wholesome desire, such as good family, good relationships, kindness, where everyone, good community, balance of everything. That's what we learned it as. Um, Okay, this one currently. Wiria is energy with effort applied in the right way. So practicing of right effort using wiria, the energy to get through the four the four principal steps using the six R's. Chita, properly balanced focus, and vivamsa a proper productive balanced degree of observation, mindfulness, the mindfulness, and proper investigation and contemplation, which seems to be the vipassana aspect of his practice. So this is where the this kind of investigation and this kind of observation matches what they tell you to do when you're looking in the books about Goenka and vipassana, don't they? but he's doing it inside as he's watching things, you see? It's where he's doing it. Now we see him bringing the seven factors of enlightenment, the Bojanga into balance to complete this path, which include the nature of his 
we keeps talking about these words, investigation, mindfulness, the sati, energy, virya, joy, piti, tranquility, pasadi, concentration, ekagata, and the equanimity or balance of mind, okay? Did Venerable Sariputta, the next question, experience Vipassana during his meditation? What insights did he discover if he did? Yes, I think he did. He realized the experience of learning knowledge and vision, knowing by seeing was extremely important to the Buddhists in his school and how one could progress well when the mind was accepted as the command center for the body. You no longer would bother going here and there to take care of things in your body. And he could understand uh, during his meditation, he could understand how, um, let's see, oops, right. He could understand during his meditation how the states and all the qualities of those states operated. So he has a really fine, fine observation skill. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. This is very clear that he was fully aware while going through these states. And he keeps saying that again and again in each level. Now, what happened to each of the states Sariputta experienced one by one. What characteristics did he experience? Well, first he has the outward framing of it. So indeed these states not having been come into being, having been they vanish. He witnesses a Nietzsche impermanence of every arising condition. He realizes an anatta, the impersonal nature of how each one arises and success of using an impersonal approach for more skillful observation of what was happening. You can probably think of some other ones, write them down, we'll talk about them in a little while. What did Sariputta learn about these states after he experienced each one? After each level he passed through, he understood something. There is an escape beyond this and this with the cultivation of that attainment that has just happened. He's letting it go by. He confirmed that there is. So he's in his little car on the life continuum line. He has a trunk, but he's not putting anything in it. He has a really nice car with air conditioning inside, fully equipped, but he's not going to get out of the car. He's going to keep practicing there. He's not going to put, and when he discovers something, he just lets it go by and he keeps going to see how much further he can get. And that's how come he's progressing. That's how come. Which one of the characteristics of existence did he learn about in this sutta? He seems to have already understood the nature of suffering beforehand and how it works. And then he witnesses a Nietzsche and a Nata. 15, how did Sariputta learn about anatta? He realized that each level has arising conditions within them that occurred independent of his practice of observation. They impersonally arose. They came up by themselves. That's what he's realizing. Now, it's true that he was reaching a condition in the right position in quality and refinement in order for that level to arise. But the statement here is true. And what happened to him when he emerged from sitting in the cessation of perception and feeling? He realized that his taints were destroyed by his, uh, by his seeing, whoops, let's see what happened here. <laughs> What happened when he emerged from sitting uh, in cessation, per, uh, cessation of per, uh, perception and feeling? Now, I said perception and feeling, but really, what are we supposed to put there? We're supposed to put perception, feeling, um, feeling, and consciousness. He realized that his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. What do you think destroyed by his seeing with wisdom means here? What happened? 
he, his experience made it perfectly clear how suffering works, how it arises, it is there and disappears. And he realized the actuality or how things work completely. Therefore, at the end, he completely understood the Four Noble Truths, how suffering works, and how to experience the cessation of suffering gradually and permanently. He went all the way through. Now, one thing that didn't get put in this, and I you know, catch myself because I don't think, yeah, okay. One thing that didn't get put in this at that time, and I can't remember which year I did this, but it was way back. It was like 2006 or no, seven, 2007, I think I did some of these. His description of what's happening and the way that uh, everything's operating is true in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, okay, first, second, third, and fourth, and then infinite space, infinite consciousness, um, nothingness. But in neither perception or non-perception, it doesn't stand. So when we go and we read that part of the sutta is a little bit different. If you go to the end of the sutta, you will find out what happens. Mm -hmm. Have Let's see, completely surmounting the base of nothingness. Sorry, Putta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception or non-perception. So I'm at section 17 in 111. Then he emerged mindful from that attainment and having done so, see, so there, there this, this changes because um, he emerged from mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he contemplated the states that had passed, ceased and changed thus. So it doesn't tell you much about what happened in neither perception or non-perception. Actually, it's funny, but in, in the Vasudhimaga, there's a good account of what we're telling you, the same sort of thing. And from our own experience, what happens is that the state of neither perception or non-perception is where you come out of your sitting, best described as feeling not sure if you actually sat all of a sudden or whether you slept. You're not sure. So it's a sleep awake. That's what we mean by a sleep awake state. And though when you, when you go to the teacher perplexed sometimes as to be able to tell him what exactly happened in that sitting, that, that deep, that last level. And the teacher will say something to you like, you know, Sometimes, well, we had this one woman, she was very good in, in um, South Korea. And we would tell her, just take a walk. Now, what we want you to do is go. She was very quiet at this level. She was sitting three, four, five hours. And so we would say to her, go out and just take a walk and tell, allow your mind to tell you, to let it pop up what happened when I was sitting and just watch and your mind will accommodate you. It will pop up a pattern. I remember that and let it go immediately, six R. You don't say, what was it? You don't question it. You're at a point where you've emptied everything out, but this is left in there from this sitting and you just let go, let it go, let it go. And you continue to say, okay, I, that's right. I saw blue, let it go. That's right, I saw that pattern go by, let it go. Okay, a, a pattern, okay, 6R, 6R, 6R. This is where every 6R, everything that passes through your mind. Then he'll say, go back and sit again after you've taken a walk, in her case, about 35 minutes. Go back in and sit again. So she would go get some water and then she would go back and sit again. And then she gets to go through because she's not holding on to anything anymore. She has seen the fruitlessness and totally come to the point of understanding nothing, nothing at all is worth distress about it. Nothing is because it's all based on a Nietzsche, whatever is happening. So, but, so there isn't very much here. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he contemplated the states that had passed, ceased, and changed thus. So indeed these states 
not having been, they come into being, having been, they vanish. And regarding the states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, uh, independent, detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there is no escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there, there is um, a, a one more escape beyond that. And by completely surmounting the base of neither perception or non-perception, he entered upon an abided in cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness, and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. He saw the, when, when we describe this, uh, you turn off, but it's not a blackout. It's different. It's a total shutdown. And when you completely turn off, then you turn back on. And when you turned off, you stopped dependent origination, just stopped. And this is where when the person's wired up, they can't register anything. In a muse, it doesn't register at all. It doesn't register at all when you're in the cessation. Then when you come back, you're turning back on, literally. And what's turning back on? consciousness feeling and the description of what's happening when you're coming back on can you tell me where that is that's in um let's see 44 is that right where she's discussing it and she's explaining stamadina i think it is and Wisaka is pushing Damadina to tell him everything, you see. And um, when she gets near the end of that sutta in 44, I think it was her, she was explaining how you don't pay any attention to signs because you're going to the signless. This is another thing I say to my students. If you're attempting to reach Nibbana, you're attempting to go to a place. And how did we say we could describe it? By telling you what isn't there. We can't describe what is there in language, but we can tell you what isn't there. There's absolutely no tension and tightness at all. There are no signs whatsoever, nothing. No reason or impetus for you to want to have a personal opinion about anything. It's, it's an event, it's an experience to go through and out the other side, you see. And when you go out the other side, the mind just opens because why? You are empty. At this point, I have mentioned to people, I did a small women's group once and I said, I'm going to help you birth the baby. But when I, you, I birth the baby, help you birth the baby, you have the baby. I don't have the baby. I can help you as a guide or a support person. But that baby, when it happens, you have to take it home and feed it and clothe it and take care of it. If you stop practicing and go home and get cocky, I did it once, big deal. It's the fade out time, it's gonna go away. It's that time you have something very precious, very, very precious to just take care of and keep practicing and don't quit practicing because it'll happen again and happen again and happen again because now it knows, your brain knows it's safe to allow it to happen. So how many times would it happen? Well, the pet question for people is how many times does an arahat and fru with fruition experience Nibbana? Can any of you guess? Tell me that later, okay. So there's a number of mundane Nibbanas. So the brain is, familiar and trusting enough to allow a super mundane Nibbana to occur. And at that point, you're going through for a particular reason and there's no more. Um, I can't put my finger on this. I'm ashamed of myself. I usually can put my finger right on it. 
Maybe it isn't here. It could be that it's in the other one. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. Um, what friend is the signless deliverance of mind here? You see, this is where you are with non-attention to all signs. A monk enters upon and abides in the signless concentration of mind. And this is called signless deliverance of mind. This is the way in which states are different and, and meaning and different in name. What friend is the way in which these states are one in the same, one, one in meaning and different in name? Lust is a maker of measurement. Hate is a maker of measurement. Delusion is a maker of measurement. Sariputta had lost his lust as a measurer and hate as a measurer and his delusion as a measurer because he understood anatta, you see? If the monk whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, abandoned in that monk, cut off at the root, made like a palm stunt, dumb away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of immeasurable deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Not that unshakable deliverance. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind is void of lust, void of hate, and void of delusion. Lust is a something. Hate is a something. Delusion is a something. You heard a sound, you hate it. You see? That's the hatred, okay? Lust is a something. You smell a, a um, apple pie you want to stop and eat. Delusion is a something. Your personal opinions jumping in there. It's something that is causing you to stop developing the condition you need in order to proceed and go all the way through. So this is what's talking about signs and no signs. The deliverance of mind that starts on page 393. You can read the Mahavidala Sutta, it's section number 43, on page 393, deliverance of mind title at section 26, 43.26. Okay, and that'll help you understand. Now, tracing what was going on in the practice, um, you can you can go a little bit beyond this paper. You can say to be continued by discussion, or you refer you can refer to the go over to the um, uh, let's see, how do we do this? I don't know how we I don't have the little thing to, okay, I have to go back for a second. You can, uh, you, you can go to this page that we made for you. And this, this is a whopper. <laughs> we tried, this was very hard to build. We had to g try to see if we could actually get what was coming and what was leaving in each one of the levels as you were passing through them. And so I still don't like it because it doesn't have the pluses and minuses, but if you, you have one of these, you go through it carefully. And the way we got it to one page, we put column one over here and we said column one descriptions. The column, column one descriptions, uh, they present what is present is uh, what is present is contact, feeling, perception, formations in mind, and enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention are active. That's true as you practice concerning any arising phenomena. Your mindset should be like this that your mind is unattracted, it's unrepelled, and it's independent. It's detached from everything and free dissociated. You're not associating it or comparing it to anything with a mind that is rid of barriers is the, is the measure on how your state, when you're staying in the jhana, there is no, no barrier, no, no hindrance. But when you pop out, of course, if one comes, you go out of the jhana. So you can't say to me, but I'm in jhana and I have hindrances. No, you popped out every time a hindrance came and went back in. So it's an in and out relationship. Now this one, uh, uh, also on this chart, we managed to put in from the first jhana, equanimity grows slowly. There's a one-footed equanimity, a two-footed equanimity across the top three-footed equanimity, four-footed equanimity that prepares you for 
the mental levels and you get stronger and stronger as it goes. And at the end, I didn't put it in, but you're imperturbable. When you get, when you go through, you become, it's an imperturbable experience. Nothing, nothing, nothing registers in your body as a disturbance when something happens. So this is, if you get this, this one, I don't know how to go out except to stop the sharing and then go in again. The third one is to take a look. You, if you don't have this, I can send you one of them. And this is uh, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, birth of reaction and aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So what this is showing you is that the green ones were impersonal links. When I say impersonal, I mean an anatomic part of the human body. You have nothing to do with how it operates. That means that... Um, the nama rupa part of the six sense doors themselves and the contact and feeling for instance you do not have any say in how that works those things are things that can be measured by by um, wiring up the body and showing results but craving clinging habitual tendencies and birth of action and aging and death is very personal and the thing that changes where the where the uh, where the line happens where it starts to be um, where it starts to be uh, craving, I enters into the equation. So Atta comes into the equation for I like it, I don't like it, mind. Before that, it's just a pleasant feeling, painful feeling, not even painful or pleasant. Doesn't amount to anything, but. Once the opinion is made, you're on your way through these these uh, these um, sections. Okay, so the one interesting thing about about this whole thing with the levels is that if you were someone who was involved in an anger management issue and you had trouble managing, how would you heal and stop reacting? How would you come away and change? your whole habitual tendency to fight back, defend yourself, take it personally, and the birth of reaction, and then the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair that happens after that happens. How do you heal? Well, the first thing you stop doing is jati, the birth of the reaction. You just say, look, when you say that, I'm not even gonna speak, I'm not gonna react, <laughs> I'm finished, I'm not going to anymore. Then you keep watching in a little notebook how these reactions happen, how you get that far. And then the next time you decide, you know that habitual tendency, it's like a personal library of habitual reactions that I give birth to during this process of cognition. And I just learned them by watching people when I grew up, that's how they behave. So that's what I do. But I'm doing it the same way every time. And you know what? I think I'm going to close the door on the library. So you lock the door, put a pad like on it and say, I'm not going to do this habitual reaction that I do with my uh, friend or my mate or my family anymore. I'm not going to. The next thing you go back one more step to clinging and you say, you know, it's a funny thing. When I was going to the library to get something and have a reaction, I was always running stories through my mind. And I'd just been reading in my little notebook those stories about what makes the dislike uh, worse. And they all come from the past. All of them come from the past. Isn't that funny? And so you say to yourself, I'm not going to cling anymore. I, the clinging is a story that runs in your mind about why you like or dislike what came up. And this includes all of your thoughts, opinions, ideas, concepts, and imagination about what poops up. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, what, what pops up, <laughs> what pops up, okay? And you can stop doing that by rec, but only when you recognize it. A person can show you this chart and say, don't do this part anymore, and it won't work. You have to really experiment with this, and the way to experiment is to have a small notebook and start writing down what's happening. Now, now the craving, you're going to be stuck with it till you have it, till you're an arahat, but you can cut down on the amount of opinion that you let come into 
any interaction. You're still going to have immediate likes and dislikes feeling happening, but you can cut it way, way down once you get back to letting go of clinging. But to say someone, there are these people sometimes will say, cling no more and you'll be cured. But you're not because you still have this personal opinion thing that's in there. But outwardly, you have abolished the habitual tendencies and abolish the physical reaction. And because you've worked so hard, you know that you have much less sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair when something occurs. From there, what I do with people is teach them forgiveness. You teach them forgiveness. And in essence, it's very interesting about the forgiveness because we like to say, we like to say that, um, that the, that the um, forgiveness is a separate issue that we always talk about. We talk about to you, forgiveness is a cousin. So forgiveness is a cousin. Cousin the LK, loving kindness, see? Okay, and we say the Brahma Viharas are working like this, the loving kindness, okay? And then the compassion, and then the joy, and then the equanimity. And we know that the reason they're so great and the way they're so strong about changing us really, really strong is because they eliminate something. This one takes away thoughts of ill will. This one, uh, it gets your mind. So when you're working through the loving kindness and compassion are certainly mixing up back and forth, you know, they mean different things. And so the compassion, when you're working, developing that, you're abandoning um, thoughts of cruelty. You're, you're abandoning thoughts of cruelty. And then this one, the joy, when it comes up, you cannot be discontent and be complaining if your, your joy is operating. Doesn't work. The mind can only do it some one thing at a time. And then equanimity is balance. This equanimity is very good balance. And so what it's abolishing is aversion. So all aversion to anything, it takes you in a place you've never been for some people. It really, really kind of takes you away into some place where you've just never been before. You know, I, I lived in uh, Philadelphia growing up in that area. And, and you know, we had um, a lot of issues with um, a lot of issues with prejudice and things going on in Philadelphia. Yeah, really true. The city of brotherly love. Okay. But it has its problems. You know, when I was at college in Boston, I, I, my heart, I never grew up in a house that my house was just not prejudiced. Now I found little, a little bit of clues. My dad may have had some prejudice, but not a lot because in the world war II in the Navy, he went on the ships with all of the black sailors and was a petty officer on the ship and they loved him. And he sent away for an accordion and he played and they danced and they sang together and he loved everybody. He just loved everybody. He didn't have a color line, you know? So I never heard anything about it. When I went to Boston, I, I couldn't understand, and this was in 1968, why, uh, you know, there was a big thing going on in Boston. They were gonna burn down part of the city. If the, if, the, if the government didn't do something about it and straighten out the housing situations and the way people were cheating the tenants and things like that. We got up one day and I was in inner city in an inner city college in Boston. And um, the commons, the gardens and the commons in Boston are these two places where the Liberty trees actually, uh, not there, but there's a metal tree they call the Liberty tree where it was. And then, the gardens are all gardens with a lake and little boats and everything. And then there's all these bushes, big bushes around. They're about five feet high and about four feet square, you know? 
well, they came in the dormitory and they told us all of a sudden, this is a woman's dormitory and it's a freshman year in college. They told us we can't go anywhere to class without having a buddy with us. We have to walk in twos to go everywhere. Well, everybody had left and Mrs. Thompson said, it's okay, you can, I'm sure you can make it to the student union. Just go down near the garden and walk straight down the sidewalk and you can get to the building. Well, I went down there to walk to the student union and um, my gosh, <laughs> there were a whole bunch of people on Commonwealth Avenue coming down and I thought, oh dear, you know, I'm not going to get there. I, uh, and then from the other side, there's 3,000 people coming across the common and 3,000 people coming down here like, and I'm in the middle. <laughs> and then the, the park guards came with their horses and I thought, I've got to get out of the way. Something's going to happen here. So what I do, I had my books in a backpack and I jumped under a bush. So I'm sitting under the bush and I looked under the bush and there's a black student under the bush and he's got his backpack on and he dove under the bush. So the two of us are in there holding on to each other and the horses are around us and they're telling people and blowing whistles and we didn't, there were no gunshots or anything. And then they broke up this big thing that was going to be a clash. They stopped it somehow. And then we shook hands and he went to his school and I went to mine. <laughs> and you know, what I learned that day was just because, just because no other reason at all. I'm the same person I was when I was 18. I'm <laughs> just the same way. Just because I have whiter skin, I could have gotten killed that day. I realized this was real, that when I came out of that dormitory, that's the only reason. There is no other reason, but that's why I could. And that's what the, the people were feeling in Roxbury. There was so much pressure on them and so much, so much hate everywhere and so much imbalance. And you think about this and I look back at that and I say, what would it have been like if what would, could it have been like if in high school they had taught them how their minds had operated? What would it have been like if they knew at that time, what we know now about the seven links in the practice jar? What could have been different? A lot of things could have been different, very, very different, you see? And it was a very crazy thing what happened that day. But the two of us under the bush, we actually ran into each other another time and we went and got coffee and sat down and talked about the bush. <laughs> the bush, because there we were in the middle of 6,000 people and where are we? And the horses, the horses were right against the bush. We, I said, we are gonna get so hurt. But I was just watching the whole thing. And he was too, but we we're both biting our lips. I think we both of us almost bit through our lips. We were so scared at the moment. The horses came so close. And then the horses made them go in different directions and go away and it dispersed. But just to know how your mind works, to know that what happens to you when you become depressed, to understand what happens to you when you have a panic attack to understand how to let go of it. What a gift this is. I don't know how it got so far away from what it was because it isn't hard and because it's such a relief and because it's so much fun to watch and teach you and see your faces light up and go, oh my gosh, I can change. And that's big one, isn't it? To know that you can change, to know you're not stuck. And now the modern research is there backing everything the Buddha teaches, backing it up. I don't know if anybody else is talking about it, but I think it's fantastic. If you have a bad habit, it doesn't, I don't care if you're 60 or 70 years old, you can change it. Because the fact is that the brain is not fixed. And the neural pathways in the brain are not forever. And all that stuff is nonsense now because of neuroplasticity, the flexibility 
of the life of a neural pathway in your brain. And now you know that you can, if you have a bad neural pathway supporting a bad kind of, or unhelpful, unwholesome kind of behavior, that you can build a new pathway for loving kindness and forgiveness and compassion and start practicing gratitude and feeling good. Nothing, nothing in the Buddhist teaching says you can't feel good. Certainly there's nothing there that says you can't smile. You're supposed to smile. You know that song from back uh, in the crooner period? I can't remember which one of them did it. Smile, though your heart is aching. Smile even though it's breaking and you are blue. I know that you'll get through if you smile through your tears and sorrow. Smile and maybe tomorrow <laughs> you'll see the sun come shining through. <laughs> if you just smile. There you go. They've been teaching this forever. <laughs> Ulysses is going to hire me. I'm going to go to New York from here. He's going to be my agent. <laughs> We're going to teach everybody you can't have a riot. You got to sing. You have to sing the right words, though. Don't sing this really stuff. Well, some of them are okay. I'll show you one. Another one is okay. <laughs> uh, there was a, I was really trying to understand the hindrances and I had a big problem with them. And I said, Bonte, they're never going to go away. This is before I knew how they worked. I would sit in the car and he'd go, you know, and get coffee or something. He'd come out and I'd be out there going like this. Boom, 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 boom. Another one bites the dust. Boom, boom. Boom, boom, another one bites the dust, and another one's down, and another one's down, and another one bites the dust. Oh, you got to get those hindrances. Stomp them out. He says, that's not the right song. You know, you got to do a different song. So I had to come up with a different song. I'm working on choosing one that really fits. Leave them alone. I had the nursery rhyme about that little Lambs followed her to school one day, but the teacher said she couldn't have the lamb. So you leave them alone. If you don't, if you don't pay attention to them in school, leave them alone and they'll go home and wagging their tails behind them. See the little lambs. That's how the teacher got them to leave the school. Well, here you've got these hindrances. Leave them alone and they'll go home and you'll be bringing smiles behind them. See, that's it. <laughs> Let's change the, change the lyrics just a little bit to fit it. Okay, uh, insanity done. All right, so what do you all think about this? This is telling you pretty clearly that he had it really down understanding how his mind had to be in that sutta in order to go all the way through like that. And he was totally aware of dependent origination, totally watching it. Remember how he was wise in the beginning? Acutely wise, wide wise, sharp wise, keen wise, so wise. And every time he said wise, that was it. He's referring to that. And what's the last, um, the last one, what does it say? Um, no, it didn't have that one phrase, right? And his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. It's not in 111, but it's in a bunch of other ones. So that's all you need to do. You see, I've had people tell me there's nothing to see. I can sit on a chair and stare at a wall and keep my eyes open. And I'm there, okay, fine. If that's what you wanna do, fine. Chill, you're resting, you're calming down. But you, can't, you can see things, you can watch what's happening. And the more you let go of this reality here, this 
level of vibration and it all calms down. Then you get to see the good stuff. And Bonte's told me many times, this is the best show in town. Absolutely, absolutely the best show in town, you know? So comments, questions. Hmm? You're gonna tell me you wanna do another sutta like that. <laughs> There's a few more in the box, but I don't, you know, they're not pertaining. Yeah, May, go ahead. Sister Kim, I have a quick question. So the yeah. support page on the jhana level, that's um, great. Um, I'm just curious uh, when that gets to like beyond the base of infinite space, etc., cetera, et cetera, the, um, it says column one still applies, so context still applies. So Contact with what? Contact with your observation of what you're watching. There's nothing, there's nothing. Uh, contact is a part of the active activity of your aggregates, okay? Body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. And just one second, I have to do something here, sort of. Made a mistake. Oh dear. That's so I was just gonna have to turn it off and tell it to go bye bye. Anyway, <clears throat> um, yeah, this is column one. Okay, that at the bottom right. Okay, and where it goes down to the end, there's no more column one when you get to neither perception or non-perception, but everything is functioning there. He can watch everything happen inside while he's observing. He can watch whatever, whatever happens. And nothingness is interesting. Nothingness is, um, well, may, it's nothing. <laughs> but the problem is when you're sitting in uh, nothingness, you're exploring like an empty spot, but you have to remember one thing about emptiness that the Buddha tried to get across to you in 121 and 122. And so when we go there, you have to look at the last, what is it, the last, um, the last page of one. There's always this one last page 121. Everybody's talking about emptiness. And then the Buddha comes up with this statement which secures the, the, the belief that he did not teach emptiness. Nargajuna tries to pick it up later and de design a school for emptiness. But in reality, the Buddha tells you the truth and he explains it like this. Um, there is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the connected, that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. So he can still sense, the, feel the contact of what's happening inside. You practice in um, Satipatthana, you practice uh, in inside and outside. Is what is meant. He understands the field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. The field of perception is void of the taint of being or be uh, of uh, habitual tendencies or reactions. It's void of that. The field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. There is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and they are conditioned by life. Thus, he regards it, this is what he's saying about neither perception or non-perception, he's saying thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present. Thus, this is present. So even when he gets to a place where there's absolutely nothing and neither 
perception or non perception. Yeah. He's still saying when it when you feel completely convinced there's nothing there, the nothing is what's present. <laughs> it kind of pulls your mind apart, doesn't it? <laughs> it kind of pulls your mind apart. You got to go sleep on it. Do get some good sleep and then sleep again and then get up. Okay, you're okay. It's, it just pulls your head, pulls your brain apart. But the Buddha was not willing to say emptiness because he didn't, he didn't believe in it. And I'm kind of glad because I think MIT and NASA, they proved that space is not empty. And all the, when I was young, outer space was a void, a cold, frigid void. Now they know the truth. We've got garbage up there. <laughs> It's all those, all those old pieces of everything, you know, but, um, <laughs> but it's, but it's, uh, it's not, it's not empty. And then I remember we went back to them. We said, so what's there? And they said, an intelligent something. I loved it in a, something with intelligence, but nobody could say what the something was. It was great. <laughs> so Go to 121, go to page, um, um, page 121, go to page 968, section 10. Read through it slowly. You listen to the descriptions a little bit here of when he's talking about nothingness, maybe it helps you out. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to perception, of, neither perception, not perception, we're still not there, tens of percent. Wait Attend, not attending to perception, the base of infinite space, not attending to the base of infinite consciousness and hence the singleness dependent on perception. Oh boy, there's a lot about it. Wait a second, we have to go back further than that. Um, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, not attending to the perception of infinite consciousness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. It's section eight. 121 section eight on page 967 okay. attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of, of nothingness his mind enters into that perception of the base of nothingness and acquires confidence steadiness and resolution he understands thus whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. It's all gone. There's none of the is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. That's gone by and it fades out. And then you're in the cave. <laughs> I keep saying you're in the cave. There is present not only this non voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there. As to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. So you relax into it. 
The problem for you if you ever get caught in nothingness is you want somethingness to be there. <laughs> <laughs> that's it and if you ha are an energetic person if you want to you're somebody who makes everything happen and you manage people and big projects and everything this does not fit you it's not part of your conventional reality to ever 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 have your mind just totally stop thinking see you're always having to have a thing in the thinking get it? We could make poetry about this. Thus, Ananda, this too is a genuine, just undistorted, pure descent into voidness. You see, and then it goes on. This sutta is a reductionist sutta. It takes you from a point in the beginning through all these different levels and gets you to understand that's not there anymore. That's not there anymore. It's a test. Did you put it in the trunk or not in your little car? Or did you really let it go by? You see, did you really say never mind when it was over? There's something new here. And the reason you're searching, the reason you're irritable, think about it, is because of the encyclopedia in our head. We're hunting for something this must relate to. It's like an argument. One woman came and just sat there and said, I kept saying that no matter what Bunty said. But it's a concept way, gone away, and it's, e it's easing you into understanding a Nietzsche. And even this state of neither perception or non-perception is affected by I'm sorry, neither perception or non-perception, right, is affected by a Nietzsche. It will change. Are you, you see, the depth of cessation, you see? So the big one is having good equanimity and looking at all of this, the way that Sariputta was investigating and how was he doing it? He was just looking to see what happens next and not taking any of it personally. You put those, you should write the, um, oh, what do we say? You write the words down that are in each one of the verses and you put them on the wall and you keep checking about which one you are holding on to, you see? And it's like, uh, it has, um, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, dependent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers is the last one to go, isn't it? <laughs> okay, but see, he's not attracted to it. He doesn't want it. He's given up that. He's unrepelled. He's not going to push anything away. He's just there, like the two-year-old who just peeks around the corner just to see what happens next. That's all, you see? And we're stuck when we've done the job you've done and I've done before in Washington years ago. You know, we're stuck with all this stuff from the world in there. And our mind thinks has been operating, even if we think we've cut it, made it clear, you're not to do that anymore, mind. You're just supposed to let me watch. But your mind has encyclopedia britannica in there and it wants which page are we on now <laughs> you know what is this nothing what is this nothingness one person went for a number of years before she decided to give it give it up and just watch says so that's two words just watch and it doesn't seem like it should be hard susan did you have a question i saw you were down there. Oh, by the way, Sister Kima, it's Little Bo Peep. The, oh, uh, that's it. Rhyme. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep. No, wait a minute. 
Is that right? Little Bo Peep who lost her sheep and can't, can't know where to find them. Leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them. Thank you. That's where that comes from. Yeah. So these, the thing is about the, the hindrances, you have to stop feeding them or they'll just come home to you, <laughs> you know, but if you stop feeding them, they'll go away and they won't come back. They'll fade away. But, but we have to keep a notebook about this so we can check and see how much of us desire this or that. And we think we're letting go, but we're still, it's still in there. You see? Yeah, good. Anybody else? Ardika, you didn't like my singing, huh? <laughs> I yeah? do, I do. <laughs> you do, you do. <laughs> but anyway, I, I went off the deep end. There was a really, the reason I had the bump, 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 another one bites the dust is because the Eagles used to be a big group. And they actually their songs, their words were really pretty good. And, you know, they got older and then they did this big concert and I had the, the album and I took about four or five songs off of that, trying to explain to this really serious musician. He was a very, um, I can't remember his name. It was in North Carolina and I had to hang out with him for half a day while Bonte was doing some things in a temple. And, you know, I was trying to get him to understand what all this is about. And he was so wrapped up in what had happened three, four years ago, he wouldn't leave it alone in his mind. And you have to let things just go and look what is essential, what is unessential. Nothing is essential. Everything is unessential because it's only going to be here when it's actually here in the present time. And then it goes away, you see. And... Um, he couldn't let go. So we sat there in the car and we took like maybe five different songs and rewrote the lyrics and started talking about hindrances. And I tried to show him no matter what you sing anymore, you have to understand you're just singing about hindrances. <laughs> and you know, it's, he wouldn't leave them alone. He had to get involved in them personally, everything that had happened. But what had happened was many, many years before. And that's the danger in all of this, see? So anyway, Sariputta comes up with this list of ideas for you to use for your mind when you're practicing. Take a look at the sutta, write the list down, keep examining it. That's what we did tonight. Oh boy, did we. We scrutinized it, <laughs> scrutinized it, and really tried to look. Now we have to contemplate what it meant how does it pertain to us? Can we let go of that? And can we notice, don't get angry at yourself if you see you're still getting attached or you still want to get repelled from something that's popping in your mind. Look at how it operates and stop feeding it and just keep letting it go. And the message is to empty out, empty out, empty out, empty out. You know, we used to pay all this money for each one of the kids to have a bucket and a shovel and a container to make something on the beach out of sand. And I was sitting there, we spent at least a whole dinner for the family for all of us to eat, buying these buckets so that all they do is pick up the sand and then they dump it out <laughs> they pick it up and dump it out. And they did it all afternoon. They were fascinated with picking up the sand and dumping it out and filling it with water and washing stuff away. And I thought, that's amazing. Look how they're serious about that. They're really concerned. So we built a castle and I made sure I was gonna build it where when the high tide came up, I wanted to see, I went up the beach after. I mean, I built a really big English castle and it had turrets and walls and sticks for flags and everything it was really big. I put it right where the water was going to come. And I went up there and just sat there and watched them, what they were going to do about it, because the ocean was going to come and take it away. And they hemmed and hawed and one of them started crying and everything else. And finally, they just sat there and, and started watching it. And that's what we're all doing. We're just watching everything 
arise and it's there and it's passing away. Arise and it's there and it's passing away. So you gotta relax into it. Yeah, gotta relax into it. Okay, are we done? Are we okay? Yeah, we're done. Some of you are ready to pass out. <laughs> okay, we have, um, now I have to, let's see. I, what I'm doing is not gonna be disturbing you guys at all. I'll still be there Wednesday night. I'll still be there on Saturday night. I'll still be there on Sunday night, but we're starting a retreat. We're trying it a new way. We're gonna try this, see how it works. So we're doing it, uh, Bonte and I are doing it with 10 people. And uh, each one of us is gonna be interviewing five of them face-to-face -face on Zoom. So we're gonna be doing our interviews this time from 1.30 until, <laughs> I like the way you said that. I just hope there isn't somebody who wants to push the until, you know, very late. But um, so we open the room and they come and sit in, they, they are in the, um, in the waiting room and we can pull them in and, have, and interview them and let them go home. That's how we're gonna do it. And um, I'll let you know how this all works because I don't know if you've done retreats with me before, you know, sometimes I write you four pages back on five questions, but this can't be like that. So we're gonna see how we can streamline this a little better. I bought the duct tape already. <laughs> You know, so I don't talk too much, but we're going to try to see if we can do it this way. And um, we'll do it again next month if we, uh, if it works pretty well, it'll make it easier for us and we'll do more people in the one next month. So now I'm thinking uh, that we could set up a waiting list. There's already four people on the waiting list. So if you want to get on the waiting list for it, you can... Um, let me know or let Dama Gavesi know and we'll keep a waiting list for the next couple of months. We'll do it at least once a month, okay? Okay, so let us, oh, I brought you something. I, I didn't know if everybody knew this or not. So I, I brought you that, isn't that nice? Right there. This is our prayer at the end of our, our meeting. If you've never seen it before, Well, it's all right. Let's see. I can fix that. I can fix it. Oh, we have the technology. We can do it. This is probably huge. I don't know what it is, but let's see. Let's find out what it is. Oh, well, that's that's kind of huge. All right. So we'll go down to here. Like That's better, right? Maybe that works. Okay. I'll, I'll move it up for you anyway. Okay. I don't even think that worked, May. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> Actually, click on that um, on the bottom right. There's a minus there, minus and plus. Oh, look at that! I on the right. Yeah. You tell yeah. me about all these neat things. Look right. at that. Right. Oh, that's so cool! I gotta call you more often, Adika. Okay. All right, let's do this. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.